when I was at school still, um, standard line matric, I was, I was under 16 and I had to borrow books, books from Joburg Public Library, but I had to go to the kids section. And then I bitched and moaned about that. And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What have you read in the children's library? And it was a vast amount. So I went to the adult section and I started borrowing books there. And I came upon the collected works of Freud. So, with great, under, well, great enthusiasm and little understanding, <laughs> of course, as a 16-year-old, I started plowing through this stuff. Then, I thought, okay, psychology, that's for me. But um, when the vocational guidance teacher at school asked us what we were going to do the following year, I said, I'm going to study psychology. And he said, you're out of your mind. And I said, why? And he said, you do want a job, don't you? You do want to eat, don't you? This is not a career. might be a hobby, but you're wasting your time. Do engineering. Become a doctor and something like that. And I was confused and horrified, and so I didn't do anything. Um, I joined De Beers, the mining company, at uh, Cullinan, and worked there for a while, maybe a year or something like that, the beers had a scheme, like a management development scheme on the admin side rather than the mining side, but I had to go to Kimberley for that. So there I was with my little suitcase off to Kimberley. Um, and that was quite an interesting thing because they had you work in a division for six months. So I had six months in Kimberley and then I was sent to uh, Clansia on the West Coast for six months. Then I came back to Kimberley for six months. Then I went to Uranjamund for six months. And then I came back to Kimberley and now I was being deployed to one of the sections. And um, I went to work study which was a big deal in those days. Um, and <laughs> I spent many a frosty day watching people digging gardens. I passed out in the theatre when I had to determine how many assistants they needed for an operation. Uh, <laughs> so they had to attend to me and the patient <laughs> who had a bad leg break or a fever break. Um, and then the beers started becoming interested in training as a, as a division uh, because Anglo-American was doing it on a big scale and the, you know, they were interlinked, the companies. So I said, yeah, I would like to do that. De Beers did something unusual. They employed a black man. Um, he was a psychology graduate, and it was the first black graduate that they'd employed in the training division. His name was Gray Mbal, M-B-A-U, um, and he and I worked together. Now, Gray had come from the NIPR to Kimberley, um, and he, <laughs> he was like a nagging mother. He used to say, Yes, you're having a good time. Yes, you are having a lot of fun. Yes, you're coming here with a hangover. Um, but you're going to be sorry. You're going to be really sorry. You should study. And eventually, in a way, to get rid of his nagging, I enrolled at UNISA. And psychology, sociology, criminology, that sort of stuff. And at the end of the first year, I came to visit my folks over here, and my dad died um, at that stage. So after the funeral and stuff, when I went back, um, I asked the beers whether they could transfer me to Cullinan so that I could be closer to my mother and the kids, which they did. Um, I worked there. Um, in the sort of salaries administration stuff and hated every moment of it. 
Um, and then I went out to Kimberley to visit my friends over there, and I saw Gray, and he said, apply at the NIPR. And I said, well, you know, I've got so few credits. He said, it doesn't matter, apply at the NIPR. He also gave me the name of Oscar Roberts, uh, I think he's his name, or Roberts, Oscar Roberts. He was a sort of deputy director at that stage. Um, I went to see Oscar, and Oscar then sent me to uh, Yvonne Skirpers. And Yvonne interviewed me, and he said, you know, I'm very interested in you, but I need somebody with an honours in psychology because we have, we're developing personality tests or we want to go into that stuff. And, you know, but let me phone somebody. So he phones and he says, OK, go down to the second floor. Fricky Favay, Dr. Fricky Favay. <laughs> it was quite a funny interview because he insisted on interviewing me in Afrikaans. And my Afrikaans at that stage was quite poor because I'd spent now five years in Kimberley and I had never spoken Afrikaans. Somehow it just didn't happen. And I substituted English words and I sort of crawled through the grammar, not very successfully. And he upped and said in Afrikaans, and he... <laughs> He had a funny way of talking. He used to say, uh, 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 quite a lot between his words. He said to me, well, one thing I can tell you, you have no hope of getting a job at the NIPR until you've learned to speak decent Afrikaans. And I thought, okay, but I'll show you. I'll show you. I'm going to learn to speak Afrikaans. So off I go. And... His division at that stage was doing huge um, surveys for the Defence Force, for Navy, Air Force, and so on, um, into the morale of the of the vanities, the conscripts, basically, and they had to do lots and lots of interviews. Two of his ladies left, one to emigrate to Israel, and the other one fell pregnant, and her husband was worried that she'd lose the child, so she stopped working. Then I got telegram. Those days we had telegrams. When can you start? So, January 1965, I present myself then up here. Um, in Fricky Favay's division, which was called Applied Social Psychology. And, yeah, we then did the surveys. It was the Air Force when I arrived there. And we used to do a whole lot of stuff over here in Pretoria, but also at these remote bases where, where there were sort of radar installations, mainly Maripskorp and Devon and places like that. Um, it was very interesting. Yeah, I enjoyed it very much. But uh, office accommodation, fortunately, uh, was a little slim, so there was a large office in which I sat with two people. Um, one was called Pietru, one was called Ilana, and I insisted that they not speak English to me, um, although both of them were perfectly capable in the language. Um, and my Afrikaans gradually improved. It improved to such an extent that I got married to one of them, to Ilana. And, um, yeah, she, she qualified at WIT, so, you know, there was no problem with English, but me, I have to polish my Afrikaans to bright, shiny Afrikaans. Um, then, <sighs> working for Fricky, um, he did a once a year, like a performance review thing. And one of the things he said to me was, um, is there anything specifically that you want to learn? And I said, yes. Um, he said, what? And I said, people talk so much about factor analysis, and I'm really not quite sure what it's all about. Uh -huh. Um 
come back tomorrow. So tomorrow I come back, he gives me a list of books that I have to get out of the library on factor analysis. <laughs> it's quite a big um, spreadsheet type data th sample and a calculator. Not a computer, that was just not on. I had to do it manually. And I sat there for three months doing a factor analysis by hand. By the time that I would have done it, I really knew what factor analysis was all about. So, I, you know, he was, he was good. He did me favours. Then um, he and I started disagreeing about a certain project. And, uh, of course, he would have his way eventually. Um, but I thought, no, no, no. <clears throat> so, in the meantime, I'd met Hilton, who was the head of a division called something like vocational guidance and selection, or selection and vocational guidance. So I chatted to Hilton, and he said, well, I would very much like to have you, but, you know, I can't just do it. Um, I have to speak to Fricky, and then, you know, we have to speak to the director, da 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 Cut. Long story short, I then started working for Hilton. I did some of the selection stuff, I did some of the vocational guidance stuff, but the stuff that really excited me was um, something that we called operational surveys. And there were, I think in the NIPR, four people who, who played quite a large role in that. Um, Hilton, um, Sally Hall, sociologist who was working there, Neville Osrin, um, still a most qualified psychologist, and me. And depending upon where the request came from, we would put together a team. Um, sometimes we would add other people um, like David Mugutamani, and you know, we would go out and we would do the survey. Um, it was really consulting. Um, we looked at organizational culture, we looked at the structure of the organization, we looked at the dynamics of the organization, and we wrote reports, not particularly scholarly, scholarly um, and not terribly long, because people in industry don't enjoy reading all that much. Um, and there was sort of this, this, this recommendations, and we prepared to assist with the implementation of the recommendations, and we were called back to the companies quite often to uh, not only to present the stuff, but to help them implement the recommendations. So it was nice sort of hands-on stuff. What, what I found fascinating um, and hugely rewarding at the NIPR um, was that it had a tradition, a custom, something like that, and it was like being transported back 5,000 years and being in Athens with the great ph philosophers. Because people would sit around. Well, there were some who played bridge. Um, but most of the time, the conversations weren't just chit-chat. People were talking about what they were doing. So although I was sort of grubbing around in my own little corner, I learned about new things that, was, that were happening in uh, neuropsychology with people like Gordon Nelson and Dev Griesel. Um, I learned about interesting work that was done with what in those days was called Bushman, some people, by Helmut Reuning, uh, Wendy Winter, who later married Ralph Wortley. Um, there was also a guy called Shapiro who was working in creativity and was some of the earliest work in creativity ever published. Uh, what else? Yeah, there was, you know, there, there were just so many things happening. Oh, Dan DeVitt. Um, Dan DeVitt, who made all these wonderful instruments um, for uh, psychological and psychomotor assessment. And it was in the days before electronics, so those things were electromechanical. Um, but 
dad was a bit of a of a secluded a recluse, a recluse, and um, you had to go down to dad and, and you know try to sweet talk him, not to waste too much of his time, but get him to tell you about what he was on to now and stuff like that. He's a wonderful man. He used to turn the little brass pots on his own lathes over there and he worked on his own. I mean, nobody else <laughs> came in there. <laughs> there was um, also, the, I think it was called the Training Research Division. Um, Dolph Skavron was head of the division. Uh, U.P. van Rooyen was part of that division. There's a guy called, there was a guy called Barent. Uh, what was Barent? Lesson. Barent Lessing, who subsequently became head of Department of Industrial Psychology in what is now known as UJ. But I was studying at that stage, and the, I learned so much more at the NIPR uh, than I learned from the books and notes and stuff that I got from UNISA. Uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Also, with the pupil pilot selection, it was hard work because there were crowds of youngsters coming through and the battery was very extensive. And that research was done under Johan Skeps' wing. Um, I, <laughs> I, I spent, must have been months altogether over the years, administering what is known as the tilting room tilting chair test. When that stuff had to be handed over to the Military Psychological Institute at some stage, we had to suddenly write manuals for tilting room, tilting chair, rod and frame, all sorts of stuff like that. But it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, and then I was recruited by Chamber of Mines Research Laboratories. And it was a about, I think, 70, 71, at the stage when the uh, new battery of selection tests for the mining industry was being developed. But there's something, if I may, that I'd like to go back to. Um, when I arrived at the NIPR, um, it was, I found it unfortunate, I was sad about it, the time that that Simon Bisheval had just left. Um, he had gone to the breweries um, and the new director was Davi Hose. But Simon's spirit, Simon's huge intellect still pervaded the NIPR when I got there. Um, people kept talking about Simon. People kept talking about the groundbreaking work that Simon did. Um, and, you know, I started asking, why did Simon leave? And, well, it was a sad story. Apparently, um, a whole lot of pressure had been exerted upon him. And um, his political correctness was called into question by the then government and he was dubbed as somebody who was rather pink and um, <laughs> it was well known that he didn't quite support this as it was kindly called separate development policy um, and because of the pressure he left and he went to SA breweries it was very sad but I was fortunate enough to be there I think just after Simon had left when, when the spirit of the place was still as it is. I went to Chamber of Mines uh, Research Laboratories. There was a, one, of the, one of the labs, because most of the research was into coal and mining and developing new equipment and some very engineering thing. But there was a, a laboratory called Human Sciences Laboratory. HSL. Uh, Cyril Wyndham was the director of that. Cyril was a, was a medical, medically qualified person and most of the research that they were doing related to physiology and heat adapt adaptation and stuff like that because the deep coal mines are extremely hot. Um, but there was a little bit part of that 
that worked with the behavioral sciences. And I became part of that. Um, and yeah, I had I completed my master's at the University of Natal uh, on data that I had collected whilst I was at the NIPL. That's actually quite a funny story if I can digress. Um, I landed at the University of Natal. Gordon Nelson was sort of a mentor to me, I think, at the NIPL. I admired him hugely. Um, and one of the other guys over there asked me to have a look at his master's dissertation, for which he had been given a, a distinction at his university. <coughs> and I said, you know me. If you ask me for my opinion, I give it. And he said, no, that's exactly what I want. So I read it, and I got angrier and angrier as I read it, because it's just not what I saw as the kind of quality that you need at master's level. Uh, so I gave him the feedback that he asked for. He didn't talk to me for quite a while. Uh, but I went, to, I went to Gordon and I threw a tantrum um, about this thing and what it was all about and how poor it was and the stats were wrong and this and that and the other. And Gordon sort of listened to me and nodded sagely with his pipe at his mouth, of course. Um, and he said, just sit there for a while. I'll be back now. So off he goes, and I think, what on earth is happening? Uh, he reappears with another person in tow. And the other person was Ronald Albino, head of the Department of Psychology at the University of Natal, who was a sort of a scientific advisor to neuropsychology. He said... Um, please tell Professor Albino what you're going to do in his department for your master's degree. Because I had said to Gordon that the job that I'd been doing, just the job, could on the... what it, it had to do with the selection of team leaders in the mining industry and various sort of bad batteries that, were, that I had developed and put together and evaluated. He said, tell Professor Albino what you are going to do for your masters. So I told Albino, Albino said, yes, yes, write the proposal, send it down to me, we'll sort it. So I did my masters <sighs> with that last project at the NIPR, um, and I went on to Chamber of Mines Research Labs. At that stage, I was working on stuff in the area of productivity, in stopes, underground stopes, mining stopes. And um, there was a, I basically um, did what is called a field experiment. So I was actually manipulating some variables in working places underground on mines in Evander, Durban, Rudaput, Deep, and some mines, the Anglo mines down in Velcom. <clears throat> and I collected that information and we did all sorts of very nice analyses. Um, there was a thing called AID, at that, which was brand new at that stage, automatic interaction detection. And Chamber of Mines had bought that program from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And the program arrived, that being sort of 71, 72, in boxes and boxes and boxes of cards, computer cards. And we were online with VITS. Online? No, we used the VITS computer. Uh, the online bit came much later, and it was a disaster. Um, but so those, that program was loaded over there, and then the data would be taken there in little bundles. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was quite a nice thing. I did it at what is now called UJ. Um, because the person I wanted as a supervisor was there, 
shortly after I enrolled there, he pushed off and went to UNISA. And UJ said, well, not a big deal if he's prepared to carry on with you. And he said, yes, he wants to carry on with me because he finds this stuff very interesting. So I did my, duly did my PhD. Um, Johannes Kepers was one of the external examiners. And, um, yeah, my supervisor called me. I went to see him and he, Johann had discovered spelling errors in headings. Now, it was before the days of word processes, so that you had to proofread and hope to God that you didn't miss anything. But I have this horrible habit of, I know what the heading's all about, you know, so I don't really read it. He reads headings. Um, and <laughs> he misses nothing at all. So, okay, then I got my PhD. Um, I became head of research in that human resources laboratory. There was sort of an applied section and another section, but I was head of this research section. Um, then uh, I was on holiday and I saw an advertisement for a chair in psychology at UNISA. And I thought, well, it's worth a try. Uh, it was just before I was, had finished my, my PhD. So I applied. They called me for an interview. Um, and after a while they say, yeah, you've got an appointment. Uh, that was a chair in research methodology and psychometrics. Nice, here we go. Um, but then uh, the people doing master's degrees in clinical psychology and in counselling psychology in the department came to me to assist with their research and research designs and stats and stuff like that. And I was horrified because, you know, they were really concepts I'd never dealt with. Um, then I said to the head of clinical training, George Vion, um, would it be all right if I sit in on the sort of blocked release courses that they had for the students? And he said, yes, no problem. Uh, and like a couple of months later, he went on sabbatical. Guy who took over, Dave Bayers, said to me, you're crazy, you're sitting in on all this stuff. Why don't you enroll for the degree? And I said, mm, OK, but I'm not going to do the internship. I'll do the, the academic requirements, but I won't do the internship. So I am now the professor in the department. And then it's a two-year course, then I am head of that department, but I'm also sitting and being taught with the master's students in my department. It was really a strangely entangled business, because at the same time, I was supervisor for some of my co-students, you know, for their dissertations. In any case, um, I got the degree stuff taken care of. But then I thought, oh God, I'm missing out on something. And that was the internship, you see. So uh, the professional board, uh, of which I wasn't a member at that stage, made an ad hoc regulation that well, clinical psychological internships have to be full-time affair. But people who were born before the end of 1941, which took me like 20 days into um, that cut-off limit, could do internships on a part-time basis, but it had to be an 18-month internship or something like that. Uh, Nisa was very kind and generous. Uh, in the mornings, you had to be there until lunchtime. But in the afternoons, you had to keep yourself busy with academic issues, but not necessarily at the university. So, in the morning, I would run the department as best I could. Comes 12, 1 o'clock, 
I'd lurch into my car and drive like a bat out of hell to Krugersdorp to Sturkfontein Hospital. And I had to do some night shifts and stuff like that. Um, when I slept in the nurse's home, um, or in a section <laughs> of the nurse's home, um, yeah, it was, it was a very rewarding experience. Um, I then was sort of involved with um, training uh, the clinical students, uh, supervising so the clinical students in dissertations, and running the department. Um, it, was a, it really was a very fulfilling time of my life. But then, sort of five years into being head of that department, 84, the uh, Human Sciences Research Council started courting me. Um, I was invited for lunch. And I had been on their scientific advisory board for uh, one of the institutes called Institute for Psychological and Edumetric Research. I was on that thing. But then the lunches and wouldn't you consider it and don't you think and the, the president of the HSRC, Johan Garbers, was involved and Bob Maria was involved and Rolf Prinsler was involved in all this sort of courtship stuff. And eventually I decided that I would go. I used to joke about it and said I was terrified that I would die of food poisoning because they keep taking me out for lunch. So at um, HSRC, uh, I became chief director of this one division, Institute for Psychological and Idiometric Research. And like three years on, um, I, become, I became vice president. Now, it is a, a rare coincidence, I think, that at just about that stage, NIPR was dropped by the HSRC and or handed over to the HSRC by the CSIR um, like as a gift. And I then became, these vice presidents had a number of institutes that reported to them. I had education and I had IPER, Psychological and Edumetric Research, and then I was given NIPR as well. Um, NIPR, that was sort of at the stage when Gordon Nelson was, I don't know, his last year or two, and things had been allowed to sort of splinter off in various directions. That, that wonderful binding stuff of Bissiavels, although it was not a focus on a single thing, you know, there was, as I said earlier, this Bushman stuff, the creativity studies, um, the, the work that was done with the pupil pilots, uh, applied social psychology, and so on. There was an anthropological division as well. Um, all that had sort of, I don't know, frittered away, and people seemed to be trying to amuse themselves, keep themselves busy with stuff that was becoming progressively more trivial. We were in a bad state, and the only person who I thought could actually, would have a chance rather, to rescue this lot was Jopie van Rooyen. So Yopi became director over there. Yopi uh, and I, like many years later, were working together again, which was a nice feeling because, you know, we were buddies from days gone by. Um, but Yopi, um, I think, also at that stage was a little tired of NIPR, where she'd spent most of her working career, um, and she decided to branch off on her own. Um, I, was, I was vice president there for six years, uh, 
And then I decided, okay, I'm sick of research management. <clears throat> I want to do something else. What do I want to do? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be nice to be an academic, do a little bit of teaching, a little bit of supervising, sitting in my dark corner and doing my own research. So there's a vacancy in industrial and organizational psychology at UNISA. I apply and I get a phone call from the head of the department, he, who was my supervisor for my PhD, and he said, um, are you serious or are you toying with us? And I said, no, I'm actually very serious. So he said, okay, you know you'll have to go for an interview. Yes, I know I'll have to go for an interview. Um, so I go for the interview and they offer me the job. Um, so I start there and I'm there for about a month and he comes to my office like as if he was, you know, checking over his shoulder type of stuff. Uh, comes to my office, sits down, but he shut the door and he said there's very, something very important that I have to tell you. And I said, what is that? And he said, well, I've decided to take my retirement. I said, oh, I'm very sorry, uh, but um, thank you for telling me, but how does it affect me? He said, are you blind? You're the next head of the department. So, run away from research management, land back in academic management. <clears throat> so I run the department of IO psychology for two years, and then somebody who used to be at the National Institute for Personnel Research, Vainant Stein, had left uh, NIPL and had uh, become a registrar, one of the registrars at UNISA, uh, registrar of professional services. So he had HR and organization development, and it was rather a mixed portfolio because security came into the picture, uh, library, public relations. In case he goes on pension, does run on stain, and I get seconded to that position. <clears throat> it's a very tricky, sort of touchy political situation um, because the Black Management Forum at UNISA is, is rather active um, and very antagonistic towards the notion of appointing white people to senior positions. So um, acting, acting, acting. Um, and then I decided, no, I've had enough of this. And there was an early retirement scheme, which I had engineered, where you could retire from the age of 57 as if you were 60. So I said, had enough trade unions, had enough of the sort of negative pressure from the Black Management Forum, early, early retirement, off I go, and I go into, well, maybe private practice. Um, this is, I don't know, 12 years ago, something like that. Um, and in my private practice stuff, I do a lot of research for organizations, um, I do some labor court stuff, um, especially in the area of, of personnel selection. Remember I told you that in 76 I became a professor of psychometric theory and research methodology. So I, I've had a long involvement with, a, with the psychometric stuff. Um, I was involved in the drafting of Section 8 of the Labor, no, not Labor Relations, the Employment Equity Act. <laughs> they wanted to drop or to uh, forbid any kind of psychometric assessment, um, the people who were drafting the law. And I and um, Kasturi Nainar, 
were asked to go down and attend these parliamentary co committees. Um, and we fought and we fought and we fought. And eventually they sort of buckled under um, and said, all right, you draft whatever you think has to go in there, which we did. It was like six months or nine months before the Employment Equity Act was, was actually uh, published. But unfortunately, I'm not clear about the year. Uh, but at least, uh, you know, we can use psychological tests and really what Section 8 says, and it was gobbled a little by the, the legal people, but it's not too bad. Um, but what it says is that you may test, provided you comply with all the sensible things that any reasonable psychologist in the world will tell you. I, I spent like 15 years on the help uh, professional board of psychology of the Health Professions Council. Um, used to be called South African Medical and Dental Council, of course. Um, the first year, first period, I was a member of the of the board. Then I was re-elected. You know, there's a sort of democratic election stuff, um, and I became vice chair whilst uh, Dio Strumpfer was the chairman of the board. Yeah, in the first term, Yanni Roberts uh, was, was chairman of the board. Um, and in the third term, I became uh, chairman of the professional board. I think what, what, was, what was important is that um, we were able to, in the third professional board, to get so-called black members in, which had never been the case in the past. And that was actually well before the 1994 election. So, uh, but, you know, you could read the writing on the wall so clearly. Um, so I think that was quite an achievement. I think what was also an achievement was that we were able to demonstrate to the public, at least those who read newspapers, that we were serious about this notion of ensuring that the public out there are protected from psychologists who don't play the game by the rules. I mean, we were tough on unethical conduct. Um, those, um, what were they called? Uh, inquiries, the inquiries that we ran. I mean, that is really a tribunal, legally a tribunal. So whatever we ruled could only be overturned by the then Supreme Court. Um, and, and there were some really bad things that, that came to our attention. A um, person who, under the grandfather clause, right back when, uh, in 73, I think, when psychologists could start registering, um, he had a BSc. Now, there was, a, there was this opportunity, a window of opportunity, and people who were earning their livings through the practice of psychology um, were permitted in. So you had people with bachelor's degrees, um, and unfortunately some of them were not near the main centres, and they had also stopped reading anything in the fields after they left university, and what they were doing in the name of psychology was whatever passed through their skulls. So we had to spank a couple of those, um, like always. Like always, uh, there was the stuff about uh, people who were accused of being sexually involved with patients now, clients, if you wish. I mean, it's a tremendous power differential be between this all-knowing psychologist and the client. Um, but you never know in those things what happened, because, I mean, 
One says it did, one says it didn't, you know. There's a, there's a nasty habit of rediscovering something and calling it something else. And the finest example of that is what something I worked on right in the beginning in 65 when I went to the NIPR was called job satisfaction. Job satisfaction, somebody actually published an article which showed that there was sort of a, a, a very steep curve in terms of the number of publications and then psh, fell flat. Ten years go by, people start screeching about organizational culture. Um, same stuff, other name. And, and that sort of thing is, is unfortunate, I think, because um, we're frittering away our energies. We're not making the breakthroughs that we should. That's not to say that there haven't been breakthroughs. Um, people who influenced my life, like Michael Brown, who's now a professor in mathematical statistics in the USA, um, they, they, they've developed lots of mathematical statistical procedures that are designed for the kind of data that we fiddle with in psychology. Um, they, 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 in the, on the clinical side, there are many new views that have, have developed over there. Um, <clears throat> in my young days, um, we didn't use the word. We didn't understand it because that would be the, like constructivism, constructionism, that type of stuff. <clears throat> and you find people doing work which is really, really worthwhile. Um, the trend is that young psychologists become, have become very resistant to doing research methodology, math, stats, and gaining an understanding of that. Um, I think most of them are innumerate. Uh, but of course, they then say, no, 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 it has nothing to do with that. Um, what it's all about is that you are following this positivist or neo-positivist scientific paradigm all on Newton and it's outdated and you should do um, qualitative work. Now, I'm, I'm not totally against qualitative work. I've seen some totally brilliant stuff. But um, I, I, I have maintained all along that qualitative research is actually much more difficult than quantitative stuff because at least the quantitative stuff gives you pointers, anchors, it guides you a little and you come up with something that is, I think, feasible. And it's not objective because in the end, the psychologist still interprets that data. Um, but it's not so easy to get lost with the quantitative stuff. That's, uh, yeah, that's the thing that I, that I regret, really. The thing that concerns me, and it is related to your question, is the fact that psychology and industrial psychology split at some stage. Um, I'm... I regard myself as very fortunate that when I started out in the field, there wasn't an industrial psychology. Because now you find people who qualify in departments of industrial organizational psychology and they understand nothing about developmental psychology, they know nothing about social psychology, they know nothing about psychopathology. And it's not good enough to say that it has nothing to do with them. Because if they're psychologists, they work with people. And if they work with people, they're going to run into developmental issues. They're going to run into social psychological stuff. And sure as God, they're going to bump into psychopathological stuff. And they don't know what to do with it. Um, so I, I think we should encourage uh, from the... Um, the, organization, the industrial organizational society angle, SALPSA, uh, we should be encouraging these young people to at least read these fields which they aren't taught in industrial psych departments. I know why they aren't taught that, because they couldn't get 
industrial psychology hived off on its own if there was too much overlap between the courses taught. So they artificially broke it up. And it's a great pity. I think the, the computer age has perhaps um, contributed to this uh, unfortunate habit of people searching only for the stuff in, published in the last 10 years. Um, when some of the most germane stuff in the field was published much, much longer, more than a hundred years ago, perhaps, um, you don't find people who really know about Freud, who know about Jung, who know about um, Thorndike, Thurston, all those old names, um, Gordon Allport. They don't know about this, you, and they don't know about Simon Bissi, who made such a contribution to psychology in this country. Um, and I think he, Simon Bissi, in retrospect, has contributed to the degree of integration that we now experience in this country. But I mentioned to young psychologists, Simon Bissi, and they look dumbfounded. They really don't know what I'm talking about. And, well, okay, then I start lecturing. I go into the lecturing mode. I'm just sorry about it. There's very little that I would want to change. Um, I th yeah, I, I would be a psychologist again, or still, if it's an extension of a hundred years. Um, I I find great fascination in working on what I refer to as the cracks. You know, like a pavement, that sort of idea. I think the, the interesting stuff is there. Uh, a, a PhD student of mine who graduated now on the 1st of September, because you know I'm involved with the University of Pretoria on a part-time basis now, um, worked on the interrelationship between what is called spiral dynamics, uh, Graves' theory, and on the other hand, uh, existentialist psychology, and how sci existentialist psychology informs that double helix model, and how you can understand more of the double helix model um, if, you, if you regard it as dealing with the meaning of life and how people see their lives, how they experience their lives. The external examiners were very excited about it. I was very excited about it. But that's one of those things that I would call on the working on the cracks. I would, yeah, if I had to carry on, like to spend my life very much more working on those sort of overlapping strange things than in the dead center of some well-established subfield or something like that.